Uh, good, uh, good evening, uh, all participants, to this webinar from MHPN, Working Together to Manage Methamphetamine Use and Mental Health Issues. Uh, so far, we have 533 people online, over 2,000 um, registered, so that number will climb during the evening. The, web the webinar, as you know, is presented by the Mental Health Professional Network. Tonight's pa panel um, are four. Uh, we have uh, Associate Professor Adrian Dunlop, uh, Ms. Vida Berkas, uh, Associate Professor Nicole Lee, and Dr. John Riley. Um, Adrian, may I just ask you uh, just a couple of questions about yourself? How did you first become interested in, in addiction medicine? Sure, look, it's, uh, it's a long story with lots of parts, uh, Michael, but I'll, I'll, I'll give a brief one. I was working uh, in an emergency department in a little uh, hospital in uh, the northern suburbs of Melbourne and uh, there were many people, well many, there was at least once a week somebody would come in with a uh, heroin overdose um, and we'd give them the naloxone and uh, they'd wake up and, uh, and uh, run away usually um, and then one time uh, a, a guy uh, had an overdose reversal and then, and then looked at me and said, Doctor I want help, uh, can you give me help, I, I want to stop using drugs. And I had absolutely no idea what to do, and nobody in the hospital said no what to do either. So it stimulated my interest to find out. That's great. Thanks very much, Adrian. And Vita, you have a, a, an excellent CV, extensive experience as a, as a, as a clinical social worker, uh, quite involved in social studies and teaching, and I've worked with Eastern Health in South Australia. How did you first become interested in uh, addiction um, social work? Gosh, again, uh, probably a long story, but I suppose I actually had my heart set on aged care, funny enough, um, up until I found myself um, doing my second university degree and had to do a fourth placement and was struggling to know where to go. Um, and I ended up working at Byron Place, a day drop in centre for homeless. and absolutely fell in love with drugs and alcohol, mental health and homelessness and the chaos that came with it um, and pretty much uh, haven't looked back since and went on to do further studies again in um, addiction and, and mental health as well just to really try to improve and be able to serve people better. Yeah. That's great, Sita. And Nicole, can you, uh, can you just tell us um, how you became interested in this area of psychology um, you, your, your CV is, is excellent and you uh, obviously are quite involved in clinical medicine, in clinical psychology. Um, I'd, I'd just like to know how you um, became interested in, in addiction psychology. Um, well, I, I wasn't actually interested in it to start with. I actually went to university to do computer science and then I hated it. So I switched to psychology to avoid having to repeat first year to do anything else. And then when I was in third year, we did this um, lecture, I had this lecture on pew exposure and how it was just newly um, starting to be used with drug users. And so I came at it from a very kind of theoretical perspective and then um, did my, uh, started doing my PhD in that area because I became really interested in how drugs worked and how they affected the brain and all of that kind of stuff. And um, while I was doing my PhD, I started working as a psychologist in mental health in clinical um, clinical work, and in in Townsville, actually, Michael and um, John, and uh, at the acute psychiatric unit. And a lot of the clients there had drug problems, and so that got me really interested in comorbidity. And then here I am from here, working in around methamphetamine, which involves both of those things. Thanks very much, Nicole. And John, you have vast experience. You're originally from Melbourne, um, and you are now uh, leading the um, um, mental health team in Townsville, covering a vast area of North Queensland as well. Um, do you find much difference between the problems that, um, that people experience with managing addictions in major metropolitan cities as opposed to in the bush? Um, look. There's obviously always some differences when you're in, um, in regional and remote areas compared to when you're in a metropolitan area, but I think this is an area where there's still an enormous amount of overlap, Michael. And I think that um, just um, the, the problem often is, and certainly my experience has been that um, I 
was interested in uh, drug and alcohol because um, that's what a lot of our patients with more severe mental illnesses often clearly have very high levels of comorbidity and yet psychiatrists back when I trained probably weren't consistently getting training in comorbid substance use disorders. It was treated as a separate kind of discipline. Um, and I think you know we've realised latterly um, that we need to do much more in that regard. And so I think that there are there's still significant gaps really within psychiatry and um, mental health services about our links. And I think that's applicable both in metropolitan services uh, as well as sometimes in regional remote services. But one advantage that some regional remote services have is that you tend to work a bit more closely together between um, alcohol and other drug services. Um, and mental health services and sometimes primary care. Uh, not always, but again, I guess small scale, although large distance, but fewer numbers of services sometimes leads to better linkages. That's great, John. Thanks very much. And, and thank you, all the panellists. I'm really looking forward to uh, tonight's um, presentations and discussions. Um, you all have such interesting backgrounds. Just a few ground rules. Um, be respectful of other participants and panelists' behaviour if this were a face-to-face -face activity. Post your comments and questions for panels in the general chat box. If you need technical help, um, post in the technical help box. Be mindful that comments can be seen by everybody. Uh, if you'd like to hide the chat, click the small down arrow at the top of the chat box. Your feedback is extremely important to us. Uh, please complete the short exit survey, which will appear as a pop-up when you exit the webinar. We now have 650 people online. We have some learning outcomes for tonight. At the completion of the session, participants will describe how to engage with people using methamphetamine to reduce harm, improve intervention and mental health symptoms, implement key principles of providing an integrated approach in the early identification of people with comorbid methamphetamine use and mental health issues, increasing the likelihood of a successful course of treatment, and thirdly, identify challenges in providing a collaborative response to people with comorbid methamphetamine use and mental health issues and share tips to over overcome these challenges. You would have all received um, a copy of Barry's um, history. Um, basically, he's a man in his mid to late 30s. He's got uh, two children ap approaching puberty. His wife has just become pregnant again. He's been working as a... Um, he's been working as a... Uh, Truck driver, and he's recently began to use speed and has moved on to ice rather rapidly, and this is causing problems with his work and with his home. Mm -hmm. We will we will now move on to Adrian, please, to give his presentation. Thank you, Adrian. Sure, thanks, Michael. So um, I guess just a couple of things to start. Uh, you must have heard uh, in the media people talking about ice. So just to be uh, clear. Um, most amphetamine in Australia is methamphetamine. There's lots of different forms. Ice is one of them uh, and is one of the purer ones, but there's also powder and base and it comes in uh, pill forms. And I guess the, the key issue just to remember overall is that um, there's been a trend over the last five years or more uh, for purity to increase. So all sorts of uh, methamphetamine, ice powder, etc., cetera, um, are all becoming purer. If you think of the effects of amphetamines, there's a range of effects, of course, and they're dependent on the dose uh, that a person has. Uh, milder effects, people tend to report feeling uh, euphoria, a lot of energy, uh, can't sit still, can't stop talking, very confident, very positive. Uh, but as the dose increase, um, there's uh, the emergence of more negative effects, so things like being un unable to sleep, being unable to eat, um, uh, having a sore jaw, sore teeth from grinding, anxiety, and then some of the more toxic uh, complications uh, as well can occur as the dose gets higher. Mental state problems um, are by far the most common problems that people experience as side effects uh, with methamphetamine. Our other presenters are going to talk to you some more, so I'm not going to go in a lot of detail uh, into mental health uh, side effects. But the common ones would be uh, anxiety, depression, and then this spectrum of thought disorder from very mild 
uh, level where people have uh, problems of being overly suspicious through to uh, full-blown psychosis where people are losing touch with reality and are seeing, hearing or experiencing things that aren't there. And you certainly get a flavour uh, of that in this case. Barry probably had some pre-morbid depression and then uh, certainly as the stimulant use went on, he's, uh, he's got more paranoia um, which might be related to his use. There's a wide range of other medical problems as well that it's possible uh, for users to experience. Typically these aren't particularly common unless you happen to be working in an acute care setting and then you do see them from time to time. Um, so different groups include um, ones related to hypothermia or the body being too hot, so dehydration, seizures, uh, muscle breakdown, renal failure, etc. A range of cardiovascular problems from um, arrhythmias uh, through to hypertension is uh, quite common actually. Uh, and then um, a risk of other problems including ischemia, infarction, etc. Uh, brain problems including uh, stroke and seizures um, and bleeds, uh, gastrointestinal problems including um, hemorrhage and uh, necrosis uh, and a range of problems in pregnancy uh, including antipartum hemorrhage. But they're not so common. Um, uh, we also have to think about uh, risks like um, blood bond virus injecting risks, especially hepatitis C uh, in Australia and hepatitis B. Fortunately, HIV is uncommon. Uh, and sexual health risks from unprotected sex. Uh, but by far the biggest uh, group of side effects that we tend to see are those related to the uh, social impacts of use of the drug. So effects on relationships, housing, employment, um, legal issues, driving issues. Um, and Barry's case really displays this quite well. You can see his, his problems in his relationship with his partner have escalated, his use escalates. Uh, and the problems uh, continue to escalate. So they're very common and clinically we see them, um, see them very frequently. In terms of just trying to have a, a diagnostic framework if you don't have one already uh, for substance use, there's a range uh, of uh, possible experiences by people who use them. Uh, at one end of the scale you see uh, use can be beneficial or at least perceived by the user to be beneficial. Um, they get positive effects and they're not experiencing negative effects. Uh, and people can have non-problematic use without necessarily becoming uh, dependent or addicted. So uh, it, it's not a case, despite what we might hear occasionally, of one hit and you're hooked. Uh, it's not like that at all. There's uh, a spectrum of use. And then further down the scale, uh, it's possible for people to have significant neg negative health problems, so harmful use or um, in DSM-5 language, um, a mild substance use disorder or, substance, uh, or true substance use disorders or dependent substance use disorders rather. Um, or in the DSM-5 language, uh, moderate or severe substance use um, disorder. So that's essentially increasing ability, uh, inability to control drug use. Um, uh, there's quick ways to screen these. So the Assist Light um, is a tool that can be used to do a quick screen. Uh, and essentially if uh, Barry had asked these questions, is he using the last three months? Yes. Uh, is he using more than once a week? Yes. Uh, and his partner's expressed um, concern, so he would score on all of those. Um, so people might um, uh, present with problems or they may not present with problems uh, and it, it we may uh, really need to ask. Um, Michael, just in terms of time, I might hand over to the next presenter and we can come no, back. No, actually, to you have a little bit of time because oh, we, great. Uh, we saved a bit it at the okay. beginning. Yep. Sure. So um, uh, just a, f a familiar approach or a good approach to use with, um, with people with substance use disorders is that a motivational interviewing. You might be familiar with it from alcohol or tobacco. Uh, but essentially it's a balance uh, of trying to get people to focus on uh, exploring the things that they like about using it for Barry, it helped him work, but the things uh, that don't help uh, him so much that aren't so good in his, in his um, situation is the amount of money he's spending and the effects that it's having on his relationship and his partner's really not coping. Um, so that's, uh, that's it for me, uh, Michael, and uh, I'll pass Thanks on. Thanks very much, later. Adrian. That was great. For plenty of plenty to discuss during the discussion time. Thank you very much. Now we'll just move on to you, Vita. Thank you. So I've been given the brief to talk um, really briefly, touch on engagement um, assessment and diagnosis. Um, and so in the first slide, I guess I've listed some of the things that um, are common that we need to be mindful of when trying to engage um, clients. And I guess I just wanted to speak to number three there, keeping the humanity in the midst of the medical and explain what I meant by that. Um, what I mean by that is 
I certainly had trouble myself when I swapped over from doing long-term case management and counselling into an acute setting where I only had a very short period of time to try to build some kind of trust and rapport with a client. And one of the things that I guess I found really beneficial is just trying to find something about that person that is unique to them, that's about them and their identity apart from their clinical presentation. Um, so if on a home visit, for instance, I might look for things like photos, um, artwork or pets are a great talking point or if it's in a clinical setting, um, then I might look for things in the collateral history about hobbies, um, someone's employment or their studies, that kind of thing, just to try to engage someone and prevent the assessment from becoming a bit of an interrogation process, particularly if we're doing long sort of comprehensive assessments. Um, apart from that, um, in terms of assessment, the first thing that stands to mind, particularly in Barry's case, is the need for a more comprehensive drug and alcohol assessment. And I guess I've just listed there what the key components are of um, a drug and alcohol assessment that we should be covering if you're doing a comprehensive assessment. If you don't have time for that, um, particularly if you happen to be a, a GP in a GP setting or an ED department, um, there is the alcohol smoking and substance involvement screening test, otherwise known as the ASSIST. Um, and there's information that um, I've added in the resource section for people who aren't aware of that um, where you can get a lot more detail. The other part of assessment that we'd be wanting to take into account is obviously mental health assessment and again I've listed what those key components are which we'd normally look for. Um, MSC standing for mental state assessment, um, examination is, is the key, one of the key things, risk assessment um, as well as family psychiatric history and past treatment history. But I guess again one of the red flags that stood out to me with um, the case vignette was when Barry mentions he previously felt uh, very down but never like now. And that for me was just a real red flag to be asking, wanting to drill down there and wanting to know, well, what was the onset of that? Um, what, what were the kinds of symptoms he was talking about when he says he felt very down? What was the severity of those symptoms? Um, you know, did it come and did it go and how does that differ from how he's feeling now? And again, just a reference to the importance of context there. Um, you know, did he feel very down in the context of a relationship breakup or a death in the family or that kind of thing? So apart from mental health assessment um, and drug and alcohol assessment, there's the psychosocial assessment um, and it's quite important even if we're from a medical background not to forget this because this is often what is also going to inform treatment um, and what might be really helpful from a treatment perspective. So I've listed the key things that we normally look at, um, finances, isolation, relationships and so on. But I guess I wanted to highlight the last point there about identifying strengths and resilience. Um, any periods where also of abstinence that somebody may have had in the past because so often the clients that I work with certainly present with a sense of hopelessness or helplessness about their circumstances and I'm really aware that I think as clinicians we can sometimes add to their sense of helplessness or hopelessness depending on the approach that we take and we can also try to build hope um, and one of the ways that I found really powerful for that is identifying the strengths and those periods of abstinence in particular um, that they might have had before or attempts to seize. Um, and I guess the last slide that I have is just about bringing that all together and suggesting that if we do a really good comprehensive holistic assessment across multiple domains, that's what's going to give us the best um, opportunity to really have a thorough um, diagnosis um, and, and pointing to a, a care and treatment plan that might be most helpful. And that's also going to be informed by, I've listed a few other things there, um, for instance someone's readiness for change and their personal circumstances but the only thing I really wanted to highlight there is the importance of spending time with people, asking them what is their substance misuse really helpful for, what does it help or assist them with or what does it make go away because so often that is what informs the care and treatment plan that we end up with. Um, 
because quite often it might start by looking like somebody needs a drug and alcohol counsellor or rehab, but when we actually drill down it turns out that what they might need is child sexual abuse counselling, trauma counselling, grief and loss counselling or something else. Um, that's it for me. Thanks very much, Peter. That was fantastic. Thank you very much. That was very, very comprehensive, very enjoyable, and will will give us much um, um, much to talk about during the discussion. And now we shall move on to um, Nicole, Nicole Lee, our, our psychologist. Uh, thanks, Michael. Um, I I just wanted to first uh, reiterate. Um, Adrian's point about not everybody needing treatment, really about 70% of users will never need treatment. And Barry is kind of in that top 15% of regular users. And we know that uh, once a week use or more is associated with dependence. So they're the, they're the people that are going to probably need tertiary treatment. And then there's a group in the middle, probably about 15% of users who um, need some kind of intervention but it won't be around dependence. Um, in terms of thinking about um, Barry and, and treatment in general, it's really important to uh, keep in mind that the meth treatment is quite a long treatment cycle. Um, you can see here that the uh, acute meth withdrawal it starts later, it's twice as long as um, other drugs, and it's accompanied by this really protracted um, readjustment period that can last 12 to 18 months for a lot of people. And that will impact on how we provide treatment, not the treatment we do provide, but how we provide it. And um, this is directly related to the action of meth in the brain. It activates um, the three main neurotransmitter systems, but primarily acts on the dopamine system. And some of the estimates um, of the increases in dopamine are something like 1,200% on baseline levels. Um, most of us probably haven't tried cocaine before, but a large proportion of us probably have had sex and most of us eat. So um, you will have some sense of uh, what it feels like when you have a nice meal or a good shag. And meth, you can see how much more meth, um, dopamine meth releases um, under those circumstances and how, much, how incredible that must feel. And that's why people use it, of course. Um, but what happens uh, in the brain is that um, if you keep using meth uh, at that level, the dopamine system wears out. Um, and the crucial thing for um, meth users is that the, um, when the brain starts having trouble producing more dopamine, the main dopamine pathways um, are run through the frontal lobe, the prefrontal cortex, uh, which is, governs all our thinking and planning and decision making and goal setting and also through that limbic system which governs um, particularly our emotional control but also um, has some impact on memory and uh, social interactions as well. Um, so when these systems are damaged, uh, when the dopamine system is damaged and they run through these two areas, these are the kind of deficits we see. Deficits in focus, attention, and concentration and memory and decision making and particularly impulse control and mood and um, that's why we get um, kind of emotional outbursts often with people who are, are long-term meth users. And that, when we're in treatment, um, and this is, we need to think through this with Barry, uh, we get these kind of problems appearing in treatment. So trouble getting to appointments and completing tasks and setting goals and stopping inappropriate behaviour and unexpected outbursts. Now, the brain changes aren't permanent, so that's good news, but after six months of abstinence, cognition is actually worse than among current users. So it's a very long time to feel quite crappy um, while in recovery. And there doesn't seem to be much improvement in long-term users in the first 12, um, 12 months or so. So we just need to keep this in mind when we're thinking about treatment options. And you'll see um, from this slide that the treatment options are identical to the treatment options for every other drug use. So if you're already treating people with uh, meth use, if Barry showed up, you would know exactly what to do. It's just putting um, some of those brain changes and some of the physical changes into, the, into that context. So withdrawal treatment we know is not effective on its own. It's just the start of treatment. And um, in fact, for meth users, there's virtually 100% relapse from withdrawal uh, when 
uh, it's not followed up with anything else. Adrian mentioned some of the significant harms associated with meth use and so it's really, really vital that we um, introduce harm reduction um, messages uh, for everybody, um, whatever type of treatment they're receiving, particularly around nutrition and sleep and some of the physical um, issues. Um, there's no pharmacotherapy and John might talk about that a bit more, but um, there's certainly symptom management around some of the um, mental health symptoms. But we do, the good news is that we do have very good psychosocial interventions. Um, we know that motivational interviewing and CBT, cognitive behaviour therapy or relapse prevention uh, is effective, even just two sessions. Um, intensive uh, CBT and uh, contingency management, uh, such as the MATRIX program, um, also acceptance and commitment therapy or ACT, which is a CBT therapy with and mindfulness and resi rehab, they're all, they've all been shown to be effective for this group. And in fact, meth users um, have the highest success in treatment. They reduce their use by more than um, other drug users and, then, and um, uh, they, can, they can get the small doses, they'll have quite a lot of success. But on the other hand, we're trying to balance that with this um, data that we know you can see here, after a year um, out of resi rehab, about 80% of meth users have already relapsed. And by three years, they're looking pretty much like people who've not had treatment before. Um, so this is um, really crucial for meth users. It's much higher for meth users than for other drug users. And it suggests that it's a drug that's relatively easy to get off, but it's very, very difficult to stay off. Um, so that post-treatment period, treatment's really important, but it's exactly the same as all our other treatments, but the post-treatment period is really crucial and that's related um, directly to that very long readjustment period for the brain. That's all I have to say. Thanks, Thanks very Nicole. much, Nicole, that was great. We'll just move on to you now, John. Thank you. Um, so yeah, and thanks for that, Nicole. That was uh, sort of set things up really around um, looking then <clears throat> a little bit more specifically at some of the uh, uh, mental health syndromes perhaps. Um, what I wanted to emphasise also was context. So as a psychiatrist, um, I will see people with, um, and working in a public setting, um, I will see people with, um, and working in a public setting, see people in um, the emergency department who are um, amphetamine intoxicated um, in our acute mental health unit and uh, then also because I work in the prison there as well as in alcohol and other drug service. And so really in any context it can be um, quite variable and I'm sure that each of you has your context in which you um, see people. So it's important to think about the context within which you're seeing people. Then think about what other substances uh, you're going to need to screen for and consider um, that are being used with the amphetamines, uh, sometimes to, um, I guess, moderate the use of the amphetamines and sometimes to help recover from them because sometimes they are contributing to problems as well. Um, the physical health problems that it might be associated that Adrian's already touched on, it's very important to always consider those and then to be looking at other psychological or behavioural problems that might be associated or might be separate um, problems sometimes to the amphetamine related problems. Um, so um, the, when you're looking at other psychological or behavioural problems, again it's obviously important to consider mood symptoms in particular, as Adrian highlighted, they are perhaps the most um, common problems that people get with uh, significant amphetamine use disorder. Um, so you need to think about depression and clearly people often become quite um, uh, down in, um, in their mood in the day um, after they've come off um, and clearly the uh, acute intoxication can become um, quite similar to a manic episode but obviously it tends to remit quickly and it's directly related to the amphetamines. But it's worth contemplating that nevertheless people with a bipolar disorder, uh, whether depressed or more often manic, can also be uh, using amphetamines. Um, Clearly the uh, amphetamine use and any mood symptom syndrome, it needs to then be explored fully if you identify a mood syndrome. So I think as Vita said, 
thinking about that and thinking about um, uh, in that context, particularly how low a person is and the risk of suicide is obviously going to be important too. Um, psychotic symptoms um, we've touched on there and one of the things perhaps to particularly emphasise is whether the patient has a family history um, of a psychotic disorder. I'm going to just talk a little bit further about that later, recognising that increased risk of psychosis in people that do have a family history of a psychotic disorder um, if you've got that, um, if you're using methamphetamine. Um, and obviously Adrian again touched on impulsivity, risky behaviours um, and so attention deficit uh, hyperactivity disorder is also um, another issue to consider. And again uh, Adrian's touched on the functional issues. So if the um, uh, amphetamine uh, symptoms present, uh, sorry if you're using amphetamines and you've got mood or psychotic symptoms, going through those but particularly looking at the timelines. So just trying to understand with the, um, the person who's using, how does the substance use link, um, the dose, the mode of delivery, therefore the overall um, impact on symptoms and how they link um, both leading up to the use as well as afterwards. How do they understand it and what strategies have they used to manage these symptoms thus far. Um, then you need to be thinking with them about their treatment plan and obviously as in any uh, such context, thinking about the severity of the symptoms, what's the risk, uh, what support network is available to the person to manage that risk and how cooperative are they with managing it. And obviously in this context if they are acutely unwell with a mood disorder or mood symptoms or suicidality or psychotic symptoms then it might be necessary to think about um, you know, more specialised mental health uh, psychiatric intervention. One of the other issues to always be considering is, is it appropriate to get some corroborative information and again that's going to depend on the context but it's going to be particularly important um, if there are some significant risks identified or if the patient's not cooperative. Um, the SHIP study did look at um, the frequency um, of lifetime use of stimulants. This is amongst people who already had psychosis and it's clear that they are really quite common. And the other issue to think about is that people who are chronic methamphetamine users, the likelihood of psychotic symptoms goes up markedly um, the more use there has been. And there's also increased further if you use cannabis or alcohol. Um, <clears throat> And if you look at a group of uh, methamphetamine users accessing a needle syringe program, again over 50% of that group had a history of lifetime psychosis and 31% current psychosis, that's a recent Australian study. Um, and really there's not much to distinguish amphetamine related psychosis from a primary um, psychotic disorder. Um, but there is a significant difference in treatment. So people uh, are much less likely to be receiving treatment for a psychotic disorder if they have a substance induced uh, psychotic disorder. Um, <clears throat> so it was just to highlight there the, the principles of treatment of acute psychosis are just as applicable in treating um, a, any substance induced psychotic disorder and particularly an amphetamine induced psychotic disorder and they're not meant to be sequential. We need to be thinking about all of these issues in someone presenting with psychosis, whether that psychosis has been induced by amphetamines or, um, or not. So just um, the only other issues to think about, the factors associated with increased use of psychosis, touched on family history, but also earlier use, earlier onset of use, a higher dose over time, possibly pre-morbid attention deficit disorder and schizotypal personality and antisocial personality disorders uh, and people with severe mood disorders and alcohol dependence may be at greater risk. Um, that and obviously there's impacts as we've touched on on striatal dopamine and clearly that's what we're looking at in causing psychosis in all people. Um, and one of the issues to consider also is stimulants um, for ADHD in adults and risks of psychosis with that group. So it's not methamphetamines but it can sometimes be a linked uh, cohort. Um, so I think the key issue is still to manage the psychosis, to refer if appropriate to an early psychosis service or its equivalent. If a person is, has a psychotic disorder uh, and they would normally need antipsychotics or be treated with antipsychotics then that should be being considered with someone having amphetamine uh, induced psychosis and we still need to be thinking particularly about educating and supporting the person to minimise their risk. And if they are on antipsychotics it's very important to consider a good plan for ceasing those antipsychotics if that's their plan. Um, and so developing smart, so specific, measurable, achievable, realistic and timely thinking around what's going to be their uh, relapse prevention strategy 
uh, either if they continue using or if they go back to use at some point in the future. I think that's it for me. Thanks very much, John. That was great. We now move on to the part of the webinar where we have our um, case discussion question and answer. And, and the first question I'm going to actually address to Zeta, it comes from Nicole, and it's in the context um, of what everybody was speaking about, uh, the, the, con the context um, of context, <laughs> um, in that we see people at different stages of illness and different stages um, of abuse and addiction. And, and Nicole wanted to, not, wanted to say, Barry has a job, family, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Residential rehab is probably not the best option. With the level of problem he is showing, he probably needs to have a period at least of abstinence. How do we balance his complex needs? Can I can I put that to you, Vita? Sure. Um, I think that's a, a really really good point because I certainly have that happen frequently to me when I get called in for consultations. Um, I work across um, various mental health teams um, here, and that happens quite a bit. That once people see drug and alcohol issues flagged, that the automatic assumption is that somebody needs to go to drug and alcohol rehab. There's often confusion about the difference between detox and rehab, um, and often the assumption is, yeah, that they need residential rehab. And I guess that's what I alluded to in my slides as well, a, the importance of doing a comprehensive drug and alcohol assessment to establish you know, how big a deal is it? Um, has it just been one-off occasional experimental use? Is it actually, is the person actually dependent? Because that's another thing that comes up quite a bit. Um, I have lots of referrals, particularly around alcohol, where when I actually unpack it, it turns out they're not actually physically dependent. They might be using it in a binge pattern, which may be problematic, but they're not physically dependent, and therefore, you know, detox itself is not clinically indicated, um, and nor necessarily is residential rehab. Um, so I think the big part about that is unpacking his substance misuse history a little further. It looks like in Barry's case he may have developed a dependence on it, um, but it's still going to be informed, as I said, by people's circumstances. So because he is married, he's got a couple of young kids at home, he's working, um, going away for three to six months into a residential rehab could be problematic for him um, and it could be problematic financially as well um, mm. because most rehabs do charge. Um, so if they can't afford to pay, that's another stumbling block quite often in which case I'd be talking to Barry about, he, he's indicated he's interested in addressing his substance misuse. Um, Apart from sort of educating him around it, I'd be talking about the detox or the treatment options around that are available to him, and that includes detox, it includes residential rehab, it includes groups like NA, um, it includes individual counselling, um, and again, it would depend on those underlying reasons for use. And one of the big things that stood out to me was a lot of this seemed to stem from the original um, issue that around finances. Um, and you know, one of the things I jotted down when I first looked at this was, could he benefit from some financial counselling to assist with budgeting? Um, is the family aware of emergency support that might be available as well? So, right, that that's question? pretty good. <laughs> yeah, pretty good idea. Could I could I, could I throw <laughs> that uh, topic over to you, Adrian? Um, yeah, sure. Could you comment on it, please? Yeah, yeah, sure. So, um, uh, I mean, I think what we do clinically. Um, a lot of the time in these sort of situations is really aimed for the least intrusive type of treatment and if that works, fantastic, and if that doesn't work, then step, step up the level of uh, intensity of treatment. So, um, and that's, that's um, the phrase uh, step care um, has been used by Amanda Baker and others uh, to describe this. So in this sort of situation, we'd uh, start by trying to engage Barry in some counselling, um, Look at the issues. Look at possible approaches. Uh, see if it's possible for him to stop by himself without so much assistance. If he can, great. If he can't, then look at a more structured withdrawal. If that goes well, as an outpatient, fine. If it doesn't go well, look at uh, residential op options. Um, if that goes well, continue counselling. If that's not going well, consider rehabilitation. So just to clarify, uh, one of the slides um, Nicole was presenting was talking particularly about um, comparing some uh, outcomes for people in residential rehab. 
by definition, they usually have more severe problems. So that's not the outcome for absolutely everybody. And I'm sure Nicole could talk some more about that. Um, but you know, for for many amphetamine users, um, CBT, cognitive um, based therapy, motivational interviewing type uh, approaches work quite well, and you get some significant reductions. You know, 40% abstinence rates after six months. So it's not perfect, uh, but it's not so bad either. Thank you very much, Adrian. Your sound just dropped out there just towards the yeah. end. John, um, you uh, you um, are in charge of a, of a very large service. You must get um, questions from GPs and registrars, um, and you must be dealing yourself uh, in your alcohol and drug uh, day with with these sort of problems. What's what's your and you alluded to the context right all the way through your presentation. Um, would you like to comment on, on what's been said? Um, yeah, look, it is about the presentation. I guess the patients that um, probably I still end up seeing maybe are often more at the, um, the psychotic end of the spectrum, though certainly not, um, not so much in the prison setting. So I think what Adrian said with regard to the stepped care, titrating um, the level of support and the level of treatment offered to what um, one the patient needs, but I guess even more so what the patient's prepared to accept. Um, so that's what I was emphasising uh, too, and I think the others have highlighted that very well. Um, we have to engage the patient in recognising the problem, and clearly that's core to, uh, to any motivational um, enhancement approach and to being able to engage a person in treatment. And often, clearly, that means that people are going to decide to continue to, um, to use a substance in a way that we might not um, uh, think is um, in their best interest, and we might be trying to point that out, but we still have to work with whereabouts the person is at that point. Now, clearly, there are sometimes uh, red flags, which mean we have to take some kind of intervention or action, but in general, we're still working um, with them at wherever they are. Thanks very much, John. Um, I'm just going to go back to Nicole, and uh, Nicole, maybe you, you might just want to comment on, on those answers that you received to your question, and then I have a question for you. So if you can just briefly respond to the answers to your question. Um, well, yeah, I, I agree that a stepped care approach is the um, is best practice, and we want to we we do want to be um, aiming at the lowest intervention that we think is going to be effective to start with. Um, and I, I think that um, uh, Beta's right that it would be really difficult for Barry, someone like Barry to go into uh, residential treatment even though he, he seems to be having quite a lot of problems around his youth. Um, and that, that certainly wouldn't be the first, um, the, the first line of treatment for practical reasons as much as clinical reasons. I think that there's a lot of things we need to think about when we uh, think about where someone needs to go for treatment and how to, how to figure that out. Now, I'm, I believe that it was Vita who said in her presentation, it may have been you, and, and I, I apologise if it was you, but I think it was Vita who said, what is it about substances that makes people take them? I mean, apart from the huge rise in dopamine that's you know, a thousand, a hundred times better than sex. But you know, the anxiety. You know, what what are they trying to? What are, what are these patients and clients trying to? What are they trying to minimise? Do you find that in therapy, um, it is helpful to go down that road? Uh, the first thing for me is that um, we need to remember that not everybody uses drugs to hide to mask some kind of trauma or um, some kind of mood uh, issue. There are a group of people who um, have uh, pre-existing problems and they do self-medicate or using drugs um, feels particularly good for them because um, everything else feels so crappy. But there's a, there's a large group of people who just start experimenting with drugs and um, they may have a vulnerability to dependence or to experiencing problems with them. And we know that a range of um, uh, trauma and uh, mental health problems increases the likelihood of that, but it's, I don't, we shouldn't make the mistake that everybody who uses drugs and gets into trouble with it has underlying problems that we need to treat. 
But if they do have underlying problems, and there is a there is a sizable proportion who do, then we do need to treat those problems. But for a lot of people, the problems um, come as a result of their drug use as well, not not prior to their drug use. So it's really important, I think, some of the stuff that Vita was talking about in terms of um, engaging people so that they can uh, give us really detailed, honest answers and we can figure out really what's going on and tailor the treatment for um, those people. Sorry, I'd just like to, oh, sorry, go ahead please. Comment? Yes. Um, so yeah, I would just wanted to really reinforce that from um, Nicole because I think as mental health professionals and health professionals more generally, um, there is that notion sometimes that it's, it's all about self-medication and uh, for some other problem and uh, you often hear it sort of said and I think that it's actually sometimes we have to recognise it's us making a kind of easy jump or an easy assumption um, and we really need to uh, you know, drill down and understand that's what's going on as Nicole was suggesting rather than perhaps just assuming that and because we hear the term used often it's an easy term for um, particularly people uh, working in the mental health setting to simply say, oh, it's self-medication. Um, I think very often there's not actually good evidence to suggest that in many situations where people use the term. Can I just add to that, Michael? Um, yeah. uh, just as an example, um, I can see a few comments coming up um, that are for and against what we've just been talking about. But just as an example, um, about a it's something like 70 to 80 percent of people who are in drug and alcohol treatment have had some kind of trauma experience some, at some point in their life, but only about 20 to 25 percent of those will have any trauma symptoms. So just having a, having some um, traumatic experience happen to you doesn't also doesn't automatically mean that you will be traumatized by it. Some people have um, some protective mechanisms and some people more, are more vulnerable to that. So it is a relatively small proportion of a small proportion that will be self-medicating. And so we, I don't think we should jump to that conclusion as the first line. Yep. yep, yep, thank you. Now just one question I had for the panel. This man's driving a truck. We don't know, we don't know how big the truck is, but I, you know, say it's, um, it, it's um, one of these big, big trucks. Um, if he presents to one of us, do, do we have a duty of care to notify the authorities? Um, I'm happy to answer. Yes. So uh, absolutely, medically, if somebody's driving uh, under the influence of a substance, uh, we've got a responsibility to inform the relevant um, driving authority. Uh, and uh, that is a tiny truck or a, um, a dual carriage, uh, sorry, yep. dual uh, yep. uh, uh, truck. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, a double of, doggy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, because of the risks uh, to society. Yeah. Um, despite this, uh, we know that driving under the influence of amphetamines uh, is common. There's no great prevalence studies. You hear all sorts of reports from um, the police about uh, them doing testing. It's usually targeted testing. Uh, and they get very high um, rates of people being testing methamphetamine, methamphetamine positive. Um, so it's possible, uh, it's still common. Um, exactly how dangerous it is from a scientific uh, perspective is debatable compared to alcohol, for example. But uh, it's illegal, so it's a mute point, really. Um, so yes, we have a responsibility. So would this prevent people, people from presenting for, for care? Adrian, would it, would it prevent people from presenting for care, do you think? Uh, yes, of course, there's many things that prevent people from presenting for care, and probably stigma about substance use is the single biggest one. Okay. Um, so, uh, you know, messages like, uh, unfortunately, the National ICE campaign about uh, people throwing chairs through windows at emergency departments and headbutting staff, that's uh, very rare, very uncommon. Uh, there's many other drugs like alcohol that are far more likely to produce results like that. So stigma about um, drug use uh, is very, very common and is, is a, a really strong driver of people not presenting to treatment. And one of the issues that um, clinically we've got to deal with at all time, people are embarrassed, ashamed, uh, feel that they can't come forward and seek help and that's a problem. We all talk about trying to eliminate stigma or assist stigma, uh, you know, the assist in getting rid of stigma in mental health. Would anybody else like to comment on that? I think that's an important point. Uh, it's John. I'd just comment that um, I think 
Uh, as I was saying before, one of the issues with, um, say, psychosis in particular, um, with, linked with amphetamines, we just need to think of it still as psychosis. So, um, to me, the term drug-induced psychosis is a major problem and we need to not use it. We need to be quite specific about what do we think might be an agent that might be triggering psychosis in an individual. And I see one of the comments was in regard to mental health services not picking or being prepared to pick people up with psychosis. And I think that's where we need to move away from a drug-induced psychosis as a notion because it seems to suggest it's all about the drug, whereas it's actually all about the psychosis. Well, not all, but to a large extent in many of these situations. And mental health services certainly need to recognise that and need to be encouraged and supported to pick people up that have psychotic disorders because it's actually core business. Um, but there is a bit of a, a split sometimes or a problem with them recognising that. Uh, and I think that's one of the strategies, and that's an issue perhaps with stigmatisation of substance use even within mental health services where you'd think there shouldn't be such stigma, but I think that's one of the problems that occurs. So we probably need to look within our own backyard as mental health professionals about ensuring that we're not stigmatising people uh, because of their substance use too. I, I um, agree with that, John. I think that's a really important point, and I think it also speaks to you know, I think some of these campaigns and the, the images that we see in the media, are, um, they're freaking the community out, but they're also scaring practitioners as well. And, and practitioners are feeling like they don't know, they don't have the skills to deal with um, meth users, and we inadvertently kind of marginalise them and stigmatise them by doing that. But um, as John said, psychosis is psychosis. It doesn't really matter what what caused it. The response is the same. The same with violence and aggression. Um, we, you know. It, it's not right that that happens, but in emergency departments and alcohol and drug services and mental health services, we're all used to um, experiencing people who are aggressive and they're not all on ice. Um, and whether they're on ice or whether they're aggressive for some other reason, it doesn't matter, the response is the same. So I think people need to just step back and, and get some perspective and understand that they, especially practitioners, have the skills to manage um, whatever is in front of them. Yep. yep. No, that's a really good point. The other point that, that's come up in a few questions that we had before the webinar from participants, and, and it's come up again just reading down through the question, is the, uh, is the vicarious trauma that many um, mental health workers suffer from dealing with um, with with patients and clients with ICE uh, use and dependence. Would anybody care to discuss that? I'm, I'm happy to start um, from, I guess, from, I work mainly with the drug and alcohol workforce, but also with the general health um, workforce. And uh, it's absolutely crucial for people who do this work to have good, uh, a good supervision structure that they work under. Um, there's all sorts of risks of working with this population. Um, uh, so uh, being having a good supervisor and uh, ideally working as part of a multidisciplinary team is a, is um, is uh, quite desirable. But even if you're working as a solo practitioner, to have some sort of peer uh, discussion of difficult patients, uh, difficult clients, um, that's really important. There are many risks. I won't go into all of them, uh, but that really protects yourself professionally and also protects your patients or clients. Uh, and and that you know I think anybody who does uh, this work as a major part of their work that's uh, Mandatory for um, for their own health and for and for their patients' health, as I was saying. So I, that, I would suggest that's uh, that's something we have to do. Actual trauma by patients is rare. You know, it's far. I think it's probably far more dangerous to work in an emergency department on a Friday, Saturday night uh, when people come in drunk and uh, behave really difficult to manage. Yes, I think that the question was more psychological trauma than than uh, physical trauma. Yeah. Anybody else would like to comment on the psychological trauma uh, amongst care, um, and amongst carers, amongst family, um, as well as amongst therapists? Yeah, I think that um, there, there's a little bit of um, work that was done by NDARC that was looking at particularly alcohol and drug workers, not, not specifically around methamphetamine, but drug use, you know, treating drug users more generally. And there, there is a high rate of kind of vicarious um, trauma and um, trauma related to um, having to deal with very complex clients quite frequently. And as 
um, Adrian said, the, the really crucial thing for practitioners is to ensure that you've got some support um, networks in, in terms of either peer supervision or particularly clinical supervision, one-to-one um, -one clinical supervision. Um, and I think that's the same for families. Families really struggle with um, people who are using meth um, in their family. They struggle with um, people who are using meth um, in their family. Uh, they often don't know what to do. They get conflicting advice that um, is uh, often unhelpful. And um, I think that it's really helpful to access some of those family support organisations and um, families need to get support as well, uh, whether the, the person that's using meth goes into treatment or not. The, um, the other question that came through quite quite frequently was um, how to get patients to engage. In, in, in general practice, I would tend to see more the families of ICE users than ICE users themselves. They may attend once or twice and then disappear again. Um, would, does anybody have any thoughts on how to engage um, people who are using ICE, or, you know, strategies, um, context? Yeah, I, I think... Oh. <laughs> Sorry, Nicole. Go ahead, Vida. No, go ahead. <laughs> um, I guess I just... If I went back to my engagement slide, the thing that comes to mind, I mean, apart from the obvious that I think most people will have heard many times, taking a non-judgmental approach and being empathic, um, one of the, I mean, some of the key things, one of the barriers that I've come across um, sometimes for young people is if they're concerned about confidentiality and it being reported to police. Um, maybe I've got a bit of a benefit where I sit in a mental health setting where I'm have covered a little bit our focus is around health and unless it's a, a major crime that they're involved in then um, I can avoid the mandatory reporting stuff um, but it depends and I think conversations clear conversations around confidentiality and where where those confidentiality lies um, and when you do and don't have to disclose can really help get past those particular barriers but the other thing that I find really, really helpful is I focus a lot with clients around neuroanatomy and neurochemistry and I find by keeping it really embedded in the biological factual side of things that that really helps um, people engage. They're expecting to be lectured, they're expecting to be told don't do this, it's bad for you and I don't think that that's a particularly helpful approach. I think quite often we're not very good at explaining why are we saying this is not helpful for somebody. Um, and if we can talk about neuroanatomy and neurochemistry and explain what's going on biologically, I find that that gets a lot of buy-in from consumers that otherwise you know, might, might have walked out because they know that what I'm saying is true because they can relate to it, they've experienced, I can explain why they're, you know, with the serotonin release and the dopamine release and noradrenaline, we can talk about why they experience the effects that they do. Um, we can explain why withdrawal looks the way that it does. Um, and by avoiding that moral, legal and ethical side of things, um, you know, I tend to get more buy-in. And acknowledging the benefits of use. That's a real critical thing, um, not pretending that all substance use is all horrible and bad. We wouldn't use. The reality is human beings wouldn't be misusing substances if we didn't find something enjoyable about it or something that's beneficial or something that gives us a functional gain. Um, and yeah, I guess the other thing that I think a lot of times I've also come across clinicians who are scared to engage because they're not quite sure like if someone says, I'm using a point of this, what does that mean? It's a tenth of a gram, but if you don't know, what does an eight ball mean? 3.5 3 uh, grams. And that scares a lot of people, but sometimes I often say to clinicians that I'm training, don't be afraid to ask. If, you, if you're caught in a situation and you're not quite sure, you don't need to fudge it and pretend. Like if you actually say to somebody, look, this is an area I'm not familiar with, and ask them, it gives... It's just a power differential, it gives power back to the client and I'm amazed at how often a client is more than happy to sit back and tell me all about how a, a particular drug is prepared or how they're sourcing it via the internet or whatever and they're quite often more forthcoming than I think a lot of clinicians think they would be. Thanks, Peter. 
Well, didn't that go quickly? We're coming to the end of our webinar. We have about 10 or 15 minutes left, and at this stage, um, we're going to move on to a summing up from the uh, panelists, and we'll go in reverse order, I believe. Somebody wrote on a par piece of parchment many, many years ago that the last shall be first. So John, <laughs> we will ask you to just sum up for a few minutes. Okay. I think uh, what Vita was just saying, it's interesting because as a psychiatrist and her talking about the neurobiology, what I was actually thinking about was it takes me back to, uh, to William Miller and to Oz. Um, as a strategy or a way of thinking about uh, how you engage with um, a patient to motivate them um, and to encourage them to stay in treatment. So always as in open questions, affirmation, reflection and summaries, just as a way of you know, how to approach an interview and that's something I certainly talk about with, um, with my trainees. The, um, but I think that the, uh, looking at the neurobiology is an interesting and a good way to approach things because with education, um, because really it's helping to affirm. Um, it's stopping the person therefore feeling under attack or stigmatised and I think that's a good strategy in that way as well as providing them of course with information. Um, so I think that's, uh, that's excellent. Um, I think just I suppose my overall summary would be I'd still come back to context and um, just going through um, the key point with regard to recognition of um, uh, psychiatric syndromes, whether it's anxiety, mood, uh, psychosis, attention deficit, hyperactivity disorder, or all the other possible comorbid syndromes that we see more frequently. Um, it's clear that sometimes there's pretty complex interactions here um, with the substance use disorder, the amphetamine use, and uh, it often does take a bit of teasing out. And I think it's important that we all recognise that complexity and um, that when it comes to um, and not jump to quick conclusions about what might be causing disorders, but to recognise that if there are those disorders there, that they, separate to the amphetamine use, can also be treated and that it's often important to try and do that um, in as assertive a way as possible with the patient, you know, encouraging them to be considering that. So I think that's probably my reflection, Michael. Thanks very much, John, and thank you for your contribution. It was excellent. And now we'll move to Nicole. Uh, yeah, I think um, we're just picking up on the last couple of things that were said around, you know, perhaps they, it's hard to engage meth users and they don't stay very long in treatment and there's quite a high relapse rate. I think we have to be quite pragmatic with this group of people. Um, I mean, if you, if, you, if you just think about perhaps they may only stay for one or two sessions or you may only see them once or twice, I, first session, even if it's an assessment session, I always um, do some psychoeducation around uh, the brain changes just so that to put that into context for them. Um, I always do some harm reduction uh, intervention, um, brief harm reduction in terms, particularly in terms of nutrition and sleep and uh, some of the physical effects. And I always do a brief motivational intervention. And so if you do nothing else, you'll, you'll have an opportunity at least once to do some of those things and you should, you should do it that. Um, and the second really crucial thing I think is, as Adrian mentioned, the stepped care approach. Um, in, if you uh, meet the client where they are, not where you want them to be, and um, move with them, then you're going to get you're much more likely to engage them, and you can always step up the intervention uh, as needed. But if you try and put someone into resi rehab when they're just not ready to go, that's not going to work at all. Thanks very much, Nicole. That was excellent. We'll now um, move to Vita. Oh. I don't know. There's a few things that um, have stood out a little. I guess one of the questions that came up was how long does methamphetamine stay in the system for, which is uh, roughly two, three days. Um, and one of the questions that came up around sort of trying to differentiate between whether or not it's, it's um, methamphetamine induced psychosis or not and one is that if generally speaking one of the things I look for being working as a comorbidity specialist within mental health is how quickly does that psychosis resolve? Is it resolving within three days or, or 
or a few more or it has the person required a two week uh, inpatient stay which is usually indicative that there's something else going on. Um, that was one of the things that I guess um, I wanted to address as we've been going through, been trying to keep track of some of the questions coming up in the general yes. chat. Um, uh, and the only other thing that I'm a, I think was kind of maybe missed flagging is just around drug interactions and particularly in Barry's case because I was thinking there's potential that an antidepressant might be considered and the risk of serotonin syndrome if we're combining an SSRI with um, methamphetamine sure. use. Um, those are yep. probably some of the burning things that were just in my mind as we've been going through. And one of the things that I would like you to comment on, uh, you know, from, from your sociology background is collaboration between, between all the different disciplines. Could you just spend a, a, a minute or so on that? Yeah, I think it's, it's absolutely critical. I mean, I've been specialising in this field for about 12 years and I guess part of what's kept me completely engaged throughout that time is the fact there's so much to learn. Um, you know, mental health is a complex area, drug and alcohol is a complex area. You're starting to talk about comorbidity and that rarely is just those two. Usually there's medical complications. Quite often people are also presenting with things like intellectual disabilities and ABIs, uh, acquired brain injuries. So I think um, it's so critical. You'll never have the skills to necessarily address everything on your own and um, I know here in this state we have a triple diagnosis group that meets regularly and um, we have people from all different sectors attending that and from different backgrounds and it's, it's critical and being prepared to, to pull knowledge and to work collaboratively um, to get the best possible outcomes is, is such a fantastic thing and you know, if we can set that up, um, hopefully that's working well in multidisciplinary team environments but sometimes bureaucracy can get in the way and we have our triple diagnosis group sits actually separately apart from the normal bureaucratic structures and I imagine Mental Health Professional Network also has its um, networks as a means that we can join in and actually pick each other's brains, you know, use each other's expertise um, that is sitting there. I think there's an awful lot of extremely skilled people and if we can actually you know, work collaboratively across sectors rather than sticking the silos and, and yeah, fold yes. to things. That it's, it's critical for the best possible outcome. Thanks, Vidim. It was really interesting and so correct. And now, moving to Adrian, you, you can, uh, if you can just sum up, Adrian, you're, you're lucky last. Sure, thanks, Michael. Um, so, uh, look, firstly, thanks to the MHPM for putting on this um, webinar. It's uh, very timely indeed. Uh, people are probably aware that the National ICE Task Force uh, that's been going around the country for the last uh, six or eight months or so is going to re uh, release a report. Uh, I think we think it's sometime early in December. Um, I hope that there'll be a whole lot more uh, resources and uh, other information that uh, might come out of that uh, for people who work in this area and you know, particularly for people and families who are affected by uh, methamphetamine. Um, so very timely, um, I guess, you know, for the clinicians uh, online, I really encourage you uh, to try to engage in this area, um, ask questions uh, of your patients, uh, your clients about methamphetamine, um, I showed you the uh, assist light, it's a pretty simple tools that uh, you can use, um, engagement of course is very, very important um, and uh, there's a big difference between uh, clinicians who can engage with patients with substance use problems and those who can't. So um, we need more of you to work in this area because there's a lot of work to be done. Um, it's not always uh, difficult and challenging. Um, Barry's case is probably uh, slightly complex. Not everybody's like that uh, and often re reasonably simple uh, counselling approaches that it's possible to learn like cognitive behavioural therapy and motivational anything can be useful. Uh, however, I don't want to sort of make it sound too simple. Uh, it can be challenging as well and if people are interested in the area, definitely suggest that they need good supervisors uh, because, uh, because having good professional support uh, is crucial. And I guess for those uh, patients that aren't going so well, um, being aware of uh, having good referral networks, you'll see in the resources um, that there's the helplines for each state for patients. Uh, also, some states have specific uh, helplines for professionals, so for where professionals can call up and get advice. So have a look at those resources um, and, uh, and see what can be helpful to you. 
Um, there's uh, fortunately there's two grants that were announced in the recent uh, NHMRC funding round specifically with uh, relation to methamphetamine. So there's some more research going on, but uh, gee, we need a lot more, and we need to continue to promote uh, this area because there's uh, much work to be done. So thank you, Michael. Thanks very much, Adrian. I, I would really, from uh, from the bottom of my heart, like to thank all, all our presenters this evening. Um, it is it is one of the best, if not the best, um, uh, webinar that I've facilitated for MHPN. Um, so much expertise, uh, knowledge um, uh, around this topic, and um, coming at it from so many different disciplines, but really all saying the same thing. Um, the uh, important of co the importance of context and how people can present at different stages of ice use and um, the the importance of just the the simple basic things that we're all taught taught in our in our social work psych addiction medicine or psychiatry training you know psychoeducation harm reduction um, one of the points that I took up is that psychosis is psychosis and drug-induced psychosis is not something separate. And I, I think that point came out very well from, from, from a number of our speakers. That we shouldn't forget our, our normal toolbox that we use for treating um, patients and clients. That we shouldn't be afraid of treating uh, people with ice addiction, uh, the use of motivational therapy, assist, all those other little things that we drag out of our toolbox or our computer, and also the recognition of um, other comorbidities that may, that may need addressing um, during the consultation or during the uh, time of treatment. One of the things that I wasn't aware of and, and one of the uh, things that, that came through to me was was the, the short physical washout from, from, um, from methamphetamines but the exceedingly long psychological washout, um, which seems to lead to that, back up to that 80% after two years, it's, it's just incredible and, and quite frightening. And I think the more webinars we have um, like this, where we can involve um, speakers of such caliber as, as the four presenters we've had tonight, the better off we will be able to, um, to, to treat um, these people. And, and I mean people not in a derogatory fashion, but they are people just like you and I who happen to have this problem. Uh, so on behalf of MHPN, I thank all our participants. We had over 750 at one stage for attending. Remembering that there will be our, our next webinar in 2016. You'll be able to download all the assets from tonight um, on the website next week. Uh, and certificates of attendance will be sent out to those who need them. Um, and also remember that if you're interested in, in furthering the work of MHPN, there are local groups that you can join at start if they don't exist in your area. Just Again, just go to the website for more information about that. I'd like to thank uh, our participants who had some um, minor um, tech problems who persisted and who stayed on, um, and all the participants in general who made some very useful content. Uh, comments which contributed to the question and answer session. I wish you all good night and if you're away from home, a safe journey home tonight. Thank you.